welcome back in this lecture we will be connecting some aspects of work which we know from a rather classical description uh, from classical mechanical description uh, with certain aspects of ideal gas and why is this important in the previous lecture we talked about the main difference between mechanical quantities and thermodynamic quantities. Uh, the main difference being that the thermodynamic quantities have something called temperature. Okay, so that is not there in mechanical quantities, the classical mechanical equations of, let's say, Newton's law. How do you make this connection? That's the first step we want to be looking at. We said that ESO thermodynamic, this particular class, uh, the object, main central objective is to extend notions of work, work energy theorem, conservation and conversion of energy that you've seen in simple mechanical system to thermodynamical systems. Okay, so that's going to be the goal. And we are going to take the first step in this direction in this lecture. So to look at that, let's uh, first define certain things. Uh, this is, seems to be a, a lot of mass uh, and this is acted by Earth's gravitational field. Okay, so, and if you if this entire force is over uh, one square meter, what does it really mean? It means that the system is um, feeling atmospheric pressure. Okay, so uh, what does atmospheric pressure mean? Uh, we, we refer to this the values here seven. Uh, 60 mm mercury or this much uh, in SI units, right? So what does it uh, mean? This entire mass uh, above this column is being present in this uh, gravitational field, right? So there is uh, all this mass, the Earth's atmosphere is present in this column. So the mercury uh, barometer uh, operates in this way, right? So the pressure here is the same as uh, pressure here, uh, on but on this side, uh, the pressure felt is because of the atmospheric column above uh, this particular uh, mercury column. There is the atmospheric column that is being present. So you can uh, quantify the pressure here, uh, not just from the atmospheric column. That is what we want to be computing. From uh, we can quantify that now. Uh, the, the pressure using the uh, height of the mercury column present here, right? So we know uh, from uh, very simple fluid statics, you know the formula that I'm not going to go over here, uh, how to think about the pressure due to a liquid column in terms of density, uh, gravitational constant, H, the height of the column and the uh, area that gives you the weight. From there, you can calculate the pressure. So this is weight. Uh, the other quantities are here. So there is vacuum here. So this pressure here is zero. And therefore, the pressure at this point uh, is the same as the pressure at this point, which is the same as atmospheric pressure. This is also uh, mentioned in the first chapter of uh, your book and in any standard uh, fluid statics or fluid dynamics book. All right, so that uh, gives us a definition of uh, atmospheric pressure and one way to measure atmospheric pressure. So we are going to use this notion in a toy model. Okay, so this is a toy model because uh, it has been simplified to illustrate a principle. Okay, without going into complexities, this model can be made more and more rigorous, uh, but that's not the objective here. But we want to make the first step in connecting mechanical quantities to thermodynamic quantities. Uh, so we are going to use the time model only for that uh, purpose, but it can be made much more rigorous. But for the scope of this class, this is sufficient. So what is the system we are thinking here? So we are thinking a closed chamber, uh, closed with a piston, right? So the chamber has a, its a volume of L times L times L. Uh, so it's like a cube, but on one side, uh, facing upwards, let's say, it has a movable piston. And the closed chamber has n Avogadro number. So I'm going to refer this as n 
AVA. So that has a Avogadro number of ideal gas atom. So what does it mean to say ideal gas? Uh, the ideal gas atomic energy is only in the form of kinetic energy. There is no interaction energy and so on. So that's the, all the energy that is present is because of the kinetic energy of individual atom, ideal gas atoms. So the pressure exerted by the gas on the piston <clears throat> is equal to, we're going to consider that situation, uh, is equal to the external pressure. So there are two pressures here. Uh, so the pressure exerted by the gas, which is inside this chamber on the piston, okay, is exactly balanced by P external. Okay, so this external pressure can be like the atmospheric pressure and so on, all right? So because of this reason, there's no acceleration, okay? The piston is not going to accelerate. Uh, there's a force balance available here. So then what we see is uh, we are considering, it's a thought experiment, but uh, can be implemented in a particular way in, in reality. So we are considering uh, this piston to be moving against this uh, external uh, pressure. How does it move? It moves in a, to a very infinitesimal extent. Whenever you say delta x, this delta x is much, much less than this uh, characteristic length that is available, uh, okay? So this is much smaller than this, uh, this value. So you can approximate uh, that the volume is not changing that much when you make this move. Uh, uh, small displacement. It is moving against this resisting force that is uh, because of the external pressure. So I can uh, represent this. I can divide and multiply by the area of the piston. If I do that, I get uh, P external times V. This V is uh, volume. Okay, so there are, uh, there are two Vs. When I say there's a small V, I'll be referring to small V. It uh, denotes the velocity of gas, the capital V, uh, uh, just to clarify, I'm not referring to velocity of the center of mass of the gas. I'm referring, I'll be referring to velocity of ideal gas atoms. Okay, so this capital V refers to volume. Okay, it's due to uh, a small displacement, there's a small change in, uh, infinitesimal change in uh, volume. All right. So you should also note the nature of this external force, okay? So the external force is an average steady force on the wall. If there is a way to measure uh, the wall, uh, force on the wall, you would only measure uh, using some particular instrument, let's say there are a lot of sensors, mechanical sensors that are available. If you measure, the force is going to be an average steady force, okay? So this entire force is actually balanced by the force uh, which is applied because of the N atoms, N ideal gas atoms present, in, present inside the chamber, okay? So it is very important to uh, uh, state this. Uh, why do, there are two words here. One is steady, okay? So that you can measure, okay, with the sensor, mechanical sensor. I also say it's an average force, okay? So let us say what uh, I mean by an average because uh, I'm also, if you measure, there can be small fluctuation, okay? Uh, around the average, very small fluctuation. We'll see why that may, might be so. Uh, but there is an average, what you would measure is there is an average which is steady, okay? The, uh, the average is not changing, but the fluctuation around the average might be changing, okay? It will be changing actually. Uh, so let us try to next compute uh, what would be this average steady force due to N atoms using a physics, classical physics, you know, from a single uh, atom collision with the wall. So this single atom, consider a single atom, this is a toy example, so with this like almost like a thought experiment, okay? So uh, we're going to imagine how things are going to be. So I'm considering an ideal gas single atom, okay? Uh, what do I mean by stochastic, okay? Stochastic means random, okay? Uh, a random force uh, due to a single collision. That's what first I want to be thinking about. 
Okay, so what is this random force? So if I measure uh, this force, okay, this is not going to be a steady force. There will be a, a collision. After some time, there won't be a collision. Then there will be few more collisions, no collision, and so on. Okay, this is a fairly a stochastic force. So uh, how do I compute the, this stochastic force? For example, so if I think about uh, just the force in terms of uh, Newton's uh, second law, right? So there is a momentum change due to collision times the number of collisions per second. Okay, so that's the way I'm going to think about uh, just the force due to a single atom. All right. So uh, so in this there's this tie example. How am I imagining? Okay, so let us call this uh, chamber is oriented along x, y, and z axis. Okay, so uh, this L is along the z axis. Okay, so this single atom, let's say, is moving along the. Uh, sorry. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Let's call this the x axis just for convenience. So this single atom is moving along the x axis. Okay, so we can consider. Uh, it moving in any direction, but just to simplify the problem, simplify the analysis, uh, we are going to consider this x-axis moving along the uh, the single atom moving along the x-axis. Okay, so this uh, chamber is also oriented in such a way that one of the side is the along the x-axis, the other two sides are along the y and uh, z-axis. So, and the single atom is moving with a velocity. V. Okay, so this velocity is entirely along the x-axis. Okay, so there is no velocity along the y and uh, z-axis. Okay, so there can be other uh, gas molecules which are moving in different direction, but the focus of our attention is on this single atom, uh, which is moving along the x-axis with the with its entire velocity along its uh, x-axis. Okay, so what is the advantage? This the advantage with this scenario is it becomes easier to calculate the momentum change per collision. Okay, so uh, what is the momentum change? It comes with the momentum of m times entire velocity along the positive x-axis, and when it bounces back, the entire it's an elastic collision, so it the entire uh, velocity is in the negative x direction, right? So you can easily calculate the uh, momentum change. Okay, so it's mv minus uh, in the minus of minus mv. So that will be two m uh, velocity. Okay, so what exactly do I use this term elastic collision? That means that uh, the momentum is uh, the magnitude of the momentum is conserved and it there's no dissipation. Okay, there is uh, the the piston might have some other ways of taking up energy okay, from this kinetic energy of the gas atom that we are not accounting for. Uh, we are uh, neglecting such effects. We are going to call this elastic collision. And with the momentum change per collision can be represented in this manner. So what is the number of collision per second? I am considering uh, there is 2L uh, for one collision. The gas molecule has to uh, travel a distance of two times the length of the chamber, right? So uh, remember the way we have specified is the chamber, the box is present along the x-axis. Um, so, uh, and the entire velocity of this ideal gas atom is along the x-axis. So the number of collisions per second would be uh, 2L divided by, uh, so this would come at the denominator, so the number of collision per second will be velocity of the ideal gas atom divided by 2L, uh, 2L, which is the length of the chamber, right? The, there's the length of the chamber. All right. So if you look at the dimensions, this is a meter per second, for example, distance per second, distance per time. Uh, so this is also distance. So you, you get just the number of collisions per uh, unit time. Right, so here we are using the time, uh, the unit of time to be second. All right, so this is where it becomes very interesting. Actually, there are these are deep issues in statistical thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. But for this tie model, this is sufficient. Okay, so this stochastic force 
due to one atom gets actually converted uh, to a steady average force, which there can be fluctuations, okay, because of this randomness, because of this uh, stochastic forces of uh, one atom, okay, uh, atom, individual atoms, there can be certain fluctuations, but you do get an average steady force, okay. Why is that? So it's very important to understand. In this tau example, okay, so the way we are going to think about this, there are totally n atoms, right? So of this n atoms, there are one third which are moving along the x axis, one third that are moving along the y axis, one third that are moving along the z axis, okay? So that's the way we are thinking about, uh, we are trying to model the system. This all becomes calculation, uh, becomes simpler, okay? So why, is, why do you get a steady force? So the steady, for, even though an individual atom may collide at a random instance, okay, you cannot really predict when there's going to be next collision, but because there are large number of atoms uh, that are being present, that's why we say uh, N is a very, very large number, right? So there are large number of uh, atoms that are present and because of which, when you look at the piston on an average, okay, the number of atoms that are colliding onto the piston is almost the same, okay? There can be small fluctuation. Uh, small, uh, fluctuation is much, much less compared to uh, the average, okay? So that is what you mean by an average study. When you say fluctuation, okay, fluctuation is just like a perturbation, okay? So that effect much be much less than the overall uh, magnitude of the average force. That is the fluctuation around this steady average, that fluctuation is much less compared to the average steady force uh, you get, okay? So, so there are two words, as I said, the steady force is because of on an average, okay? So the uh, number of atoms and the momentum transfer due to these many atoms colliding with the piston is just about the same, okay? That doesn't really change that much. If there are small, if there are fluctuations, these fluctuations are very, very less compared to the overall momentum that is being transferred to the piston at a given instant, okay? So that's why we get, so there are steady, we have also explained now with these kinds of qualitative arguments, uh, why you get a steady force and what do you mean by an average? Because we are actually averaging over all the collisions, um, the collisions of all, due to n atoms. Okay, so that's where this average uh, comes in. Okay, so this looks qualitative, uh, the, which is rightly uh, so. Okay, you are right when you, if you think this is qualitative, but uh, this can be uh, made much more rigorous. Okay, but in a uh, in a different context, I mean, statistical mechanics, statistical thermodynamics course, this can be made very rigorous uh, in terms of distribution of velocities, uh, distribution of collisions and so on. But that's not the objective of this course. Here we are going to just make one connection between the first, we're going to take the first step of connecting mechanical variables to thermodynamic variables, okay? So for that, this, is, this uh, analysis is good enough. So, uh, the take home message is the following. Okay? We have derived an expression for the force exerted by n atoms colliding with a piston. And this force is a, an average steady force. This force has been calculated via a stochastic force due to a single atom collision. And due to certain arguments which I stated, that average, the stochastic force becomes an average steady force, okay? So there are large amount of collision. This average or uh, this large averages or these collisions makes it uh, steady. All right, so I'm just converting the force into pressure. Uh, external pr pr pressure is just external force divided by the area of the piston, okay? On one side, uh, it is L squared, okay? That entire side can move, let me imagine that. Okay, so these are all thought experiments. So this external pressure, as I said, is balanced by the gas inside, which is in Avogadro. That's the number of atoms that is present divided by L squared again. And then we calculated this uh, over here. So I'm just substituting 
uh, the all these things, right? To uh, substituting all these values here. Okay, so that's all uh, we are trying to do. Okay, so just note, okay, this two gets cancelled with this two. Okay, so that's why you get m uh, v. There is an m v here times the velocity here. So you get m v squared. There is n here. There is n here. There is a three. Okay, because there are three directions present, and then there is an l here, and then there is l squared. So this gets l cube. Okay, so this is a very simple expression. So let's move on. So we have calculated in a way the pressure from first principles. When we say first principles, from from fundamental arguments. Okay, so without any approximation, and we want to connect it to an empirically measured temperature. What do you mean by empirically measured? Experimentally, uh, this is a term which is often used in science and engineering. Empirical that means experimental. Okay. Um, so we do know empirical how to connect empirically measured pressure and empirically measured temperature. This is what you call as Charles law, right? So Charles law, what does it state? Pressure that is measured empirically, volume uh, is n Avogadro number. Okay, so times Boltzmann constant times temperature, right? So this uh, in your high school you might have seen this as R gas constants as temp times temperature, but this, this is the same expression, okay? So what is gas constant? That is Boltzmann constant times uh, Avogadro number is the gas constant, right? So I'm just expressing it using this quantity because we are trying to connect it to uh, molecular atomic uh, quantities. So this is a, a law that is born out of measurements, okay? A lot of measurements were made if volume is kept a uh, uh, so a lot of measurements were made. Uh, so this Charles law, Boyle's law, you vary one thing uh, and then you see a pattern and that uh, was uh, shown as a law, right? So you know this. So what is that we are going to do? So we are going to substitute this pressure, which is an empirically uh, measured pressure with the pressure we obtain from a simple calculation, okay? So in the previous slide, right? So we are going to substitute this measured pressure, that's the external pressure, or the, which is the same as the pressure offered by the gas inside, times V is equal to this, right? So we are going to substitute uh, this from the previous, uh, the calculations we made in the previous slide, and then just substitute this right-hand side is the same, okay? So again, so we have made, um, to emphasize, we have made the connection now, okay, between some derived quantity from microscopics, okay, some property of atom, which you know from mechanics, all right, to a thermodynamic quantity. So let's understand, this is a beautiful result, okay. This, without this, okay, you cannot make sense of thermodynamics, okay. That is your intuition, that is intuition and knowledge that is born out of uh, classical mechanics cannot be connected to thermodynamics. There are two ways, okay. Uh, I will tell you the other way of connecting uh, using Joule's experiment and so on. Uh, but this is more fundamental in, in some ways because you have been exposed to classical mechanics in the previous classes, in your first year classes. So the connection to thermodynamics is made from such arguments, from arguments of classical mechanics. All right, this is what is also called the equipartition theorem, right? So this kinetic energy of the this ideal gas atom is because of uh, because it is traveling with the velocity uh, v right so uh, that is the total velocity okay this is the total velocity the so the kinetic energy of each uh, atom um, is about mv squared by 2 right so this is the kinetic energy and then we are connecting it to uh, the empirically measured temperature, just from, th this is what we computed. This is, we are obtaining from an empirical law, right? So three times KT by two is this, right? So this is what is also called the equipartition theorem. Probably you are, you've seen this in your high school, maybe not derived it, but you've at least seen this. 
what is that we have accomplished? We have accomplished something very fundamental, very important. We have made the first step in connecting what is a macroscopic thermodynamic quantity that is typically measured. Okay, so these are pressure and temperatures, and that's what we have dealt with here. And then we have connected these quantities to quantities that are derived from microscopics and what kind of microscopic? These are mechanical variables, okay? So, uh, and the main connection was uh, done by connecting our pressure, that is we derived pressure, to the empirically measured pressure, okay? So, so that's a big jump, all right? So that's a great jump. So that makes the connection between uh, microscopic to macroscopic, okay? So this jump has been made because of two important reasons, okay? If you go back to think why this jump was possible is because we had large number of uh, atoms, right? This large number made this stochastic force felt by the piston due to one atom collision to a steady force. And that steadiness is brought about because this averaging is done over n atoms, large number of atoms, okay? So, so, so that's the main reason why this entire description works, okay? Uh, because what we are measuring is steady over uh, macroscopic length scale and time scales, okay? And it is stochastic at a molecular length scale, okay? So, so this is an important jump we have made from this is the first step we have made, okay? So what is the next step, okay? So again, I'm, I'm putting a cryptic title, but I will clarify what I mean, okay? So we want to be warming up to looking at energy inwards, okay? So we, you, you, in a, from in a classical mechanics uh, courses, you have seen two kinds of energy right now, right? So in the sense that you have uh, potential energy, kinetic energy, we would be talking about internal energy, okay? So what exactly uh, do we mean by internal energy and how does that come about, okay? So you've not seen that in your classical mechanics, but you're going to see it in thermodynamics, right? So how are we going to make that second step of again, extending your notions of energy, which obtained from classical mechanics, to thermodynamics. So that's what I'm going to cover in the next lecture. So, uh, which is under this title, warming up to looking at energy inwards. With that, I will stop here. Thank you.